Joining us this evening for not really the first time, but kind of, is Ash Costello, front woman for New Year's Day. Last time we spoke, we did a roundtable discussion for Loudwire. We also aired on Loudwire Nights, as we often do with Lizzie Hale and Maria Brink. But tonight, it's all about Miss Ash Costello. Welcome, and thank you for your time. <laughs> that was awesome. Hi. Hi. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. That was like a a really crazy pinch me moment. Yeah, it was. I, that was one of my favorite moments of 2018 career wise, actually. So I think oh, wow. that. yeah, it really was. Um, speaking of last month for international women's day, you wrote about the women who have helped you grow. Lizzie Hale, Maria Brink were mentioned as was Gwen Stefani. Given that new year's day is about to go on its first ever headlining tour with whoop, whoop, congratulations. Uh, do you feel? Thank you. Yeah. Do you feel like all right? I'm that woman now, Diamante, who's opening will be marked by this experience. Like, do you have a sense of responsibility there? Um. Yes and no. Because uh, I'm I'm like a super laid back, humble person. So I feel like maybe I'm supposed to feel that way, but I, I don't. I I could I I just hold Lizzie and Maria in such like a high, crazy like from another planet category of human beings. But this this was a thought in my way. I wanted to kind of do this, the same thing that Lizzie did for me and um, just for girls and rock in general. And she did it on a big scale. And, you know, our first headlining tour is going to be a little bit smaller than the Hailstorm tour was. <laughs> so I want to do that same kind of women empowerment, but in our scene, you know. So that's, that was the main motivation in choosing uh, Diamante. In what other ways is headlining different besides, you know, you have all this stage room now. It seems like it would be more stressful. It is more pressure. That's for sure. But each, like every type of touring comes with the pressure. When you're the opening act for um, a band like Hailstorm, it's a lot of pressure to deliver on their level. And then when you're headlining, it's a lot of pressure to headline because it's all on you. You know, it's your show. Mm-hmm. If the show sucks, like it's your fault. So, but I, I love working under pressure. That's when I thrive. So I'm very, like, welcoming to that feeling. All right, excellent. We should mention the tour kicks off June 11th in Bakersfield. Tickets went on sale this past Friday. Dates and details, of course, loudwire.com. All right, let's talk about the new record, Unbreakable, number four for New Year's Day. You've mentioned that you requested to work with pop writers. A lot of has been written about it on the new album because it's something you've never done before. So like, how did that experience help you grow as an artist or perhaps shape the sound of the record, obviously? Well, I kind of just had this vision in my mind of what I wanted the music to sound like. We made a really big decision and in about, uh, I'd say spring of 2017, we decided to part ways with our previous management team and producer. It's the only person I'd ever written or recorded an album with ever. And it was because I had such a strong vision about the sound. You know, I really felt very strongly about what I wanted. And uh, so we made the decision to part ways. And the record label was very supportive of me and said, okay, what do you want to do now? I said, I want to write with pop writers. They they found me every, I felt like I wrote with every pop writer that you could (laughs) write with across the country. I was flown all over the country, tried out everybody and ended up deciding on uh, two producers, actually. One is a pop producer named Scott Stevens and the other is a rock metal producer named Mitch Marlowe. Okay. Well, that shows a lot of faith in you to like give you the opportunity to fly you around to find out who you want to work with. Like that's pretty badass. It was. I mean, it was really scary. One, I hate to fly. And two, it's like, okay, I'm just going to fly to New York and write with some guy I've never met. But it worked out really well. The song, that all the songs on this album were written with different people, you know, Skeletons was written with one pop writer. My Monsters Nice Ride was written, written with another pop writer. I'm Done With You was written with a metal and pop writer in New York. Like uh, each song was partnered with someone else hmm. and it reflects in that song. And it was really cool. And really, I learned a lot this year as far as songwriting goes, a lot of new techniques, a lot of ways to think about approaching songwriting that I'd never thought about. So it was definitely a huge growing experience for me. Can you give us one example of a different way of approaching a song? Well, I think my biggest hurdle that I overcame and learned um, from Scott Stevens mostly was um, not to be so hard on yourself and to kind of breathe with the song. Because in my mind, I always like wanted to get the song done. And if it didn't come out right away, then that meant it wasn't good. And I had to learn that that's not realistic at all. And so this is the first time ever in my songwriting career that some of these songs took a year to write. 
because I'd step away, let it breathe, come back to it. And I'd never written like that before, ever. So that was definitely helpful. Because before it was, you have two days to write the song and that's it. Whatever you come out with in two days, that's your song that goes on the record. And it's just not a healthy way to write that way. It's just, it's just not. But, but some songs can come out that quick. Like, shut up, we did in one day. We just never know what's going to happen. Yeah, we're definitely going to talk about Shut Up because we are playing it often on this show. Unbreakable was released this past Friday. Got to mention that first of all. I heard the whole thing. So the following questions are loosely, and I do say loosely, (laughs) based on the songs. Okay, so starting with uh, track two, which is Misunderstood. You sing, I'm just Miss Misunderstood. When was the last time you felt misunderstood? Um, Every day. (laughs) Every single day. I feel like I'm, like, people look at me like I'm an alien. or like I'm talking a different language from another planet. Because I'm misunderstood by everybody. Every day. But I do my I do my best to, like, try and read people and communicate with them how I feel like they'll best be willing to understand what I'm saying. But, yeah, every single day. <laughs> All right. That's not good. Um, unbreakable. I know. It's, it's, it's kind of a hassle. Yeah. Me. I wonder if it's the hair, the genre of music, because you're a very sweet person. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. Well, sometimes it's not that, like misunderstood in like a mean way, but I definitely get stared at a lot in a way where even when I'm talking, they look at me like, "What are you even saying?" You know, like, Ugh, let me try and rephrase it. <laughs> that's try just and use different words. That's just because you're beautiful, Ash. That's it. They're just they're in awe. Oh, stop it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Track four, Unbreakable, the title track. You've spoken about this kind of newfound strength within yourself. What are some of the things that came together for you in like the last year or two that made you feel unbreakable and also named the band's new studio album as such? Um, A lot, like a lot of normal life stuff. Like um, since the last studio album, going through a lot of breakups, a lot of betrayal and friendship and employees and business partnerships. And uh, romantic relationships, just a lot of bad stuff going on. As as my band got bigger, I started making more money and started gaining more notoriety for myself. I noticed that a lot of people were showing an ugly side to them. And I had to make my circle very small. And I had to really fight to keep the French, the few friendships that I thought were worth keeping. And it was a huge stretch on me, like emotionally and um, mentally to kind of learn how to let the past go, learn how to not be bitter, learn how to not be petty, you know, just so many, so many hard life lessons all shoved into a three year period. Mm -hmm. And I came out the other side and I feel really good about what I built and what I let go of. So it definitely made me feel unbreakable. You could hear it. You could hear it in the songs. I will be running my ass off to that one. Thank you. Maybe I'll get over my three. Oh, you're welcome. That's a good one. That is a good uh, gym song. Side dog, a gym song. And empowering. It's my favorite song (laughs) off the record. So Thank you so much. You know, we were a little worried about that song at first because the the riff was so ugly. Mm. And that was on purpose. You know, I, I wrote that song with our previous guitar player, Jeremy Valentine. And I remember telling him, like, how do we make this riff uglier? How do we make it sludgier? How do we make it dirtier? Keep going, keep going, keep going. And because of that, that song was really hard to write a melody to. So that song took us probably like a year. And I think that's the last song we finished for the record. So we didn't know what to do with it. We had no idea where to go after that riff. We're like, now what? <laughs> so from the, the song that took a year to the song that took a day, the latest single, Shut Up, which, as mentioned, we are playing here on Loudwire Nights. So I always like to ask kind of what inspired the song and how it came together so that when we go into the track on Loudwire Nights, listeners get a little bit of the backstory. Well, this song was a co-write, and um, it was a co-write with Scott Scott Stevens, the producer, who's done Shine Down and Hailstorm in this moment, all the all the big songs that we know and love. And um, a girl named Chrissy Costanza, who sings in a band called Against the Current, who is an incredible pop vocalist. And um, that team came came up with Shut Up after I played them a few Kehlani songs. And I, I played Scott Crazy and Do you Dirty by Kehlani. And I said, what would this sound like if it had guitars in it. If it had heavy guitar riffs, what would that be? 
because that's what I'm trying to do on this song. And so that's how Shut Up was born. And what inspired it? Um, just the the general theme of the record, which is being misunderstood. It's, you know, don't try and tell me who I am. Don't try and tell me what I want. Just listen to what I'm saying and then shut up and do that. And it, I felt like that was very a Kehlani way to approach that, that thought. Because it's just so literal. It's just so like, here's a line just straight from a journal. And I feel like that's more of an R&B tactic when it comes to lyrical songwriting. I'm like, I don't know who Kehlani is. Is that like a new rock act? I've, I've never heard of Kehlani. Oh, dude. <laughs> dude. Okay. So we fell in love with Kehlani when we did the Pump, Punk Goes Pop volume cover song. We covered her song Gangsta mm. that she did for the Harley Quinn theme song of Suicide Squad. So obviously that's how I found her because I love Harley Quinn. And it was such a good marriage. You know, Kehlani um, publicly said she loved the song. Everyone loved the style of our song Gangsta, and it's our most streamed song on Spotify. And I remember thinking, there's something to this here. There's something to taking up an R&B pop song and making it metal. So Kehlani's R&B and pop, and I would highly recommend listening to Crazy and Do Dirty, because those songs are two of my most favorite uh, written, like, songwriting example songs. Okay, all right. I'm going to give that a Google later. I'm going to do it. Um, not rock at all very <laughs> army no wonder i'm like listen i read about every sa- like i'm on loudwire 24 7 who is this uh, okay it makes sense now yeah you gotta check it out though you'll love it i will i will i totally will this is ridiculous but track seven poltergeist immediately made me think of the movie by the same name you know run to the light caroline so yeah that <laughs> you know, was the inspiration was it yeah totally i mean the original version of it was ba- way more obvious it was like the original lyrics were like, I feel like a kid trapped in a TV set. And then we were like, okay, that's a bit too specific. Let's reel it back a little bit. So it wasn't, it was inspired by the movie. Did not know. I didn't pick up on that. I know you mentioned Exorcist as well. Really, the question was, though, what's your favorite scary movie? My favorite scary movie, like, of all time? All time. Nightmare on Elm Street. I, I go with the classic. Excellent. Plus, Freddie's so likable. Likable? He gave me nightmares well into, like, the age of 15. <laughs> that was so terrible. Me, me, me too. Me too. But as an adult, I'm like, he's so funny. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. No, I'm with you. I like Freddie versus Jason. I like, like, the not really super scary Oh, movies. me too. <laughs> awesome. I love Freddie versus Jason. I thought they did a great job. But the <laughs> Freddie remake was a big no. I've never heard anybody else say Freddy versus Jason was good. Oh, my God. I love Freddy versus Jason. The kills in that movie are hilarious. Hilarious. It's more of a comedy, though. Yeah, it is. I know. It is. Okay. All right. Moving on. Break My Body, track eight. Seemingly about a very passionate relationship, right? So outside of music, because we don't want to get too personal, what are you most passionate about? Um, I'm very 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 passionate about animal rescue very passionate about animal rescue i outside of music that's what i do the most spend time with my animals i have two rescue dogs and i have two rescue cats and we're always trying to raise money for uh our favorite local rescues there's one we really love that we met at warp tour when they brought a bunch of uh puppies to the backstage area of warp tour they're called rock and roll rescue we've done um Hey, Nikki, what was that when we did the PBRD? What was the dog rescue we did? It was like, oh, Motley, Motley Zoo. It was called Motley Zoo. Um, so we like all the, like, rock and roll-themed animal rescues, obviously. And, uh, yeah, that's what we're, we're really, really passionate about. I've picked up dogs from really cruel, low-rated pet shops across the country, yes. and I'll give them to fans. Oh. I try to take them myself, but the band says no. <laughs> There's no more well, room. <laughs> so the fans have scored some dogs. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's that's definitely my other big passion. That's sweet. I love it. I'm sure you heard about this. It's disgusting. I don't even want to bring it up, but I can't control myself. The woman, the Coachella chick who threw all the puppies in the garbage can, you know, they arrested her ass. Good. I know. Good. They caught her. I mean, I was... who does that? I know. I know. That was the most disgusting story, but uh, happy ending. So just wanted to bring it up. I'm on offer up in Craigslist a lot for various things and whenever I see someone giving away an animal for free I'll I'll write to them and send them the articles about why it's dangerous to give away animals for free 
And I'd say half the time I met with hostility and the other half and people like, I had no idea I'll take it down. But I just think like, how do you give away a family member? You know, how do you do that? Oh, you're talking to somebody who's obsessed with their dogs. So I don't know. Yeah. Animal rescues, rock and roll rescue on Instagram, hand in paw, slaughterhouse survivors. And I think those are my three, I'm kitten rescue LA. Those are the, those are the best ones that I work with. Love it. Love it. Um, track 10, My Monsters. We all have that voice in our head you sing about. What's the biggest monster you've ever overcome, whether that was a reemerging thought or pattern? My biggest personal like inner monster was lack of self-confidence for a really long time. Like a horrible lack of self-confidence. Like I'd hide behind my hair. I couldn't look people in the eyes. I was embarrassed to like order drinks at Starbucks. You know, just general talking to people. I'm really proud of how much work I put into building my own self-confidence on my own. How were you able to get on stage that way? How was I able to get on stage when I was lacking self-confidence? Yes. Um, I, because I, I can't explain that one, I guess. I mean, I, there's a big, if you go back and watch like um, live footage, if you can find it, <laughs> please don't. Of like 2007 <laughs> and 2010 and 11 if you notice a huge difference in how I am on stage opposed to how I am now, I would go up on stage because I pushed myself, but the confidence was not there. And you can see it. It's very, very obvious. And then just something clicked. They around 2012, 2013. And I just learned how to feel like a badass woman. You know, I was just learned how to feel confident in what I had to offer. And I, I started to feel worthy and I started to love myself and I started to really enjoy who I was when before it was like comparing myself to other people and constantly putting myself down and always feeling like I wasn't good enough. So I am still, I think that's a journey that every woman will always be on. Yep. I don't think that journey ever ends. Yep. 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 It sounds yeah, familiar. But I think you can get better at, at like having the tools in your mind to help yourself when you, you have those harder moments. Personally, I think it's experience, at least for me. I mean, the first time I interviewed somebody, and I know it's totally different for everybody, but the first time I interviewed somebody, I couldn't even get the words out. And I still have like anxiety about it, but uh, experience, in my opinion, uh, yeah. helps. Yeah, major. I think so too. Mm-hmm. I always say confidence is a muscle in the body. Just like any other muscle, you have to go to the gym to work it out if you want it to be strong. Mm-hmm. You know, it takes practice and and like it takes working it out. I agree. Uh, the last track on the record is titled I Survived. So why is I Survived the perfect song slash perfect note to end the record on? Because it sums up the whole record. That's really that's really the, the theme. If I could have named the album I Survived, because it doesn't quite roll off the tongue <laughs> like Unbreakable. But if I could have named the whole record I Survived, that's what it is. You know, I Survived. I'll probably have to learn how to survive more hard stuff in the future, but from the previous record malevolence to now, I survived it all. And I, I just, that's my favorite song on the record. I feel like uh, those are the best lyrics I've ever written. So they're really simple and to the point and exactly, exactly how I feel. And I, I feel like writing lyrics that aren't metaphorical, that are just literal and it has to say how you feel are harder to write. So I was really proud of that one. Nice. I have one last question. And it is the last question for a reason. It's kind of touchy, but I believe it's super important. Um, And it's kind of long because I'm explaining the situation. So bear with me for a second. In 2012, New Year's Day was on tour with Blood on the Dance Floor. And your band did not complete the run because, as you stated years ago, bravely, I must add, I watched too many fans get abused and I was abused myself by this person. I no longer felt comfortable where I was. All right. So fast forward to 2019, the floodgates have opened on their front man, Davi Vanity. The latest is he's being accused of rape and sexual assault by 21 women, 16 of which are underage. The band's been removed by Spotify in response. What are your thoughts on the current situation? Because you were saying, hey, listen, something's going wrong here. Well, I wasn't the first. There was a girl named Lady McGrady who actually sang on one of their songs called Bewitched. And she came up first in an article in a magazine, like a smaller magazine, and no one paid attention. It was a time before Me Too. It was a time before people would believe the victims first 
enough for, I don't know how to say that right. Like, not that you should just blindly believe victims, but I feel like this was a time where it was more realistic that the public would start shaming the person speaking out instead of looking into it or possibly believing that what they're saying could be true. So, yeah, we wrote that blog and, and I got attacked by a lot of kids saying that I just wanted attention. I was just trying to use Dobby's fame, which is laughable. And no one really believed me. But because I came forward, a lot of fans who had been abused by this person came to me and sent me their stories. And most of them had physical evidence and proof. So I went ahead and turned that over to the police. There's a case file. It's an actual filed police report. And uh, I tried to kind of be a part of it in any way that I could. Because this person is so just, I don't know, whenever I try to speak about it again since, I still get a letter or an email from him saying he's going to sue me. So it's still a thing to this day. Um, but I'm, I'm, I think that, you know, I always kind of sat back and go, this, this will come out when it's meant to, you know, because predators don't stop until they get caught. Yeah. That was a very rah rah sis boom blah karma go get him in the ass moment. For, I, I have to imagine. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And that uh, that happened. Let's see. They said uh, I had filed that police report maybe six years ago, seven years ago. So I mean, that's a long. That's a pretty decent amount of time. But I think no one thought it was important. And I, I really commend the Huffington Post for taking it upon themselves to really look into it more. Because even the when I went to the police it was met with a very lazy attitude of like, oh, this has happened in too many states, just a jurisdictional issue. We can't really do anything. It's a lost cause. Your band had nothing to gain and a bit to lose by you standing up to this person. And that speaks volumes about your character. Thank so, you. Of course. So one more time for Thanks good measure. So yes. Thank you. So one more time for good measure. Unbreakable, the new album out everywhere for your listening pleasure. The unbreakable headlining tour kicks off June 11th in Bakersfield. It's Ash Costello of New Year's Day. Thank you, madame, for your time. Much appreciated. Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's nice to hear from you again. Same. Till next time.